Hello, uh, our new lecture is on orientations of single crystals. So, before going to start just let us know that why we need the study about the orientations identifications or maybe why we need this informations. So, as we know that many of the properties of polycrystalline materials have been explained by studies of isolated single crystals, because single crystals are anisotropic in nature which requires the accurate knowledge of the orientations of the single crystal test specimen in order that measurements may be made along known crystallographic directions or may be the planes. By varying the crystal orientations data on the property measured like yield strength, electrical resistivity, corrosion etcetera is obtained as a function of crystal orientations. There is also an increasing production of single crystals as we know not for research studies, but for use of as such in various devices mainly electrical, optical or maybe some kind of magnetic operations or maybe that applications. Example if I give the example of an silicon crystals for CPU and RAM in computers just we are using tremendously and for semiconductor based consumer products single crystal nickel based super alloy turbine blocks or maybe the blades which are very high creep resistance. These crystals must all be produced with particular orientations. So, before uh, going to in depth study of that uh, projections just let us know what is the stereographic projections or maybe that angle true projections. So, generally the crystal informations can be illustrated from their planes and angles between planes these already we have gone through in our previous lecture. So, stereographic projections helps in representing the angles between the faces of a crystals and the symmetry relations between them. It represents planes as points on some representative surface which maintains the angular relationship of the points to each other. So, this is the very vital point that angular relationship of the points to each other. Say suppose uh, this is the single crystals, so this is the planes across that planes that uh, we are just assuming that it is confined in a sphere. So, in that sphere the point will be lies on the sphere itself. So, where the points is perpendicular lies is known as the pole and then if we make a uh, line from that pole to the uh, uh, pole point to the any pole either it may be north or south and intersecting the projection pen is known as the F over here. So, in this particular case C is the crystal plane as I already told and C p is the plane normal. So, this is the normal this is actually 90 degree over there. So, this is the 90 degree. So, now from here what we are going to do and this is the reference sphere. So, the stereographic projections is a projection of points from the surface of a sphere onto its equatorial plane. If any point P this point on the surface of the sphere is joined to the south pole S as I told already and the line this P S cuts the equatorial plane at a point this is the a point. Then F is the stereographic projections of point P. So, now we have to go more in depth that what is pole and what is stress. Suppose consider a plane in the unit cell and allow the plane to extend in space it will cut the reference sphere along a circle this is the trace of the plane. So, in this case is you see that this is the circle it is forming along the sphere. So, this is known as the stress and this is reference to this n or maybe this pole. This is the north pole and this is the south pole and this is suppose your point P. So, irrespective of P the trace is looks like this. Take the perpendicular to the crystal plane it will go and intersect with the reference sphere it will be the pole of the plane. Trace and pole of the plane are at angle 90 degree with each other. So, simple if you see the stress and if you see the trace and the pole. So, it is perfectly the 90 degree over there. The trace of a plane passing through the center of the sphere is a great circle that is circle of maximum diameter yes of course. And if it is not passing through the center 
or it will intersect the sphere in a very small circle. So, this is the pole over here and this is the trace because all the points lies on the stress itself. Now, construction of a stereogram for a crystal, how we are going to do it? So, the cube of a crystal is kept at the center of the sphere. In this image, you can see that we have kept the crystal at the perfectly uh, center of this particular sphere. All the planes normal are drawn from the cube surfaces, they cut the sphere on some particular points or maybe the poles. So, here all the points it has cut over there. We orient the crystal such that the pole to the 0, 0, 1 phase where is 0, 0, 1? This is the 0, 0, 1. So, face is vertical and points to the north pole of the sphere. So, you can see. Then we draw a line from the point on the sphere directly to the south pole of the sphere itself. So, just we are drawing a line. Poles are projected on the equatorial plane or maybe the projection plane from north or south end of the reference sphere. So, you can see that this is cutting in this particular point, in this particular point and in this particular point and in this particular point. So, if we see from the top because observer i is here, so this is the observer i over there. So, simple this point that 0, 0, 1 bar and 0, 0, 1 it is into the same point and this is 1 bar 0, 0 is here, this is 1, 0, 0 is here, this is 0, 1, 0 is here and 0 1 bar 0 is here. So, that means what? Just we are seeing from the top and we are plotting all the points. So, this is the basic circle and this is known as the projection plane. So, some basic terminology to understand the stereogram is a face is designated by Miller indices in parenthesis in first bracket like first bracket 1 0 0 bracket closed, then first bracket 1 1 1 bracket closed etcetera. A form generally we are giving it into second brackets. So, is a phase plus its symmetric equivalence in curly brackets like second bracket within 1 0 0 or maybe second bracket within 1 1 1. And a direction in crystal space is given in square brackets like third brackets into in between that 1 0 0 or maybe 1 1 1 into third brackets. So, now we have gone or maybe we have received this point, this is known to me, 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 this is known to me. Say suppose I am having some points which is in between 0 1 0 and bar 1 0 0. So, I want to calculate of this. So, what I am going to do? Just I will add all these value. So, bar 1 0 0 plus 0 1 0 that means this point will be bar 1 1 0. So, same thing like that. So, I will get all these points over there and then I can get this image that the points or maybe that uh, positions of all the points over here. Now, you can see over there some points are in square in bracket, some in oval shapes or maybe some in triangle which I will come later. So, now standard stereographic projections of cubic crystals. So, a standard stereographic projection shows the angular relationships between different poles for a given crystal orientations. Actually, from 3D just we are converting all the points and the projections into 2D. So, it provides maps of low index directions and planes for identifying the crystal orientations. Example, standard stereographic projections of cubic component. So, just here we are telling the form. So, you can see that is in second bracket. So, in this particular case we are giving the forms second bracket 1 0 0 within second bracket 1 1 0 and within second bracket 1 1 1 have 6 phases that for 1 0 0 it is hexahedron, for 1 1 0 it is dodecahedron and 1 1 1 it is the octahedron, how in the stereogram respectively. Say suppose when we are talking about the 1 0 0 family, so you can see there are total 1 2 3 4 5 and 
another point. So, total 6 points you can get it over there because 1 is back of that one and that is in square. Square means it is the fourfold because each plane are 90 degree each other. So, this is for the 1 0 0. So, and when we are talking about the 1 1 0 family, so you can see that they are a total 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 and another 4 points are there which is the back of this particular back side of this particular form. So, that means it is bar 101 opposite is 101 bar then it is 0 1 bar 1 which is 0 1 1 bar it is 0 1 1 which is opposite is 0 1 bar 1 bar it is 1 0 1 which opposite is bar 1 0 1 bar. So, like this way so that means it is in oval shapes that means it is twofold. So, it is having 180 degree angles plane each other. So, this is for the 1 1 0 and when we are talking about 1 1 1 family. So, in this particular case we are getting total 8. So, that is why it is octahedron in nature and we are getting this shape strangle that means it is having the threefold which is the planes are 120 degree each other. So, this is for the 1 1 1 family. So, now we are going to discuss about the zone of crystallographic planes. So, what is zone? Zone is nothing but a set of planes whose intersection lines are all parallel to each other. So, in this case we are having different planes over there. So, intersection lines. So, this is known as the zone axis which is generally denoted by u, v, w or maybe some other planes. So, the intersection line is called the zone axis. The planes of a zone axis which is within the third bracket u, v, w must satisfy the wise zone law which tells us h q plus k v plus l w is equal to 0. So, the direction of zone axis for h 1, k 1, l 1 and h 2, k 2, l 2 set of planes we can calculate the value of u v w like this way u is equal to k 1 l 2 minus l 1 k 2, v is equal to l 1 h 2 minus h 1 l 2 and w is equal to h 1 k 2 minus k 1 h 2. So, if we know the value of h 1 k 1 l 1 or maybe h 2 k 2 l 2. So, easily we can calculate the value of u v and w. The poles of planes of a zone will all lie on the same great circle on the projections and the axis of the zone will be at 90 degree from this great circle. So, in this particular image you can see that point 0 1 bar 1 is the zone axis for which point 1 0 0 1 1 1 0 1 1 1 bar 1 1 and then 1 bar 0 0. So, same thing has been written over here. So, now we are going to discuss about one interesting things that is called the wolf net. So, wolf net is generally if we remember the longitudinal and the latitude of earth then we can simply uh, get the informations of any point that where it is lying based on the longitudinal value or maybe the latitude value. So, a stereographic net or wolf net is simply a stereographic projections of the lines of latitude and longitude of a sphere onto a central plane. So, observer is over here. So, from this place we are looking over there. So, this perpendicular line is known as the longitude lines which is called the great circles not parallel except at the equator. And these horizontal lines is called the latitude lines or small circles parallel everywhere. So, this is the reference sphere. So, from this we are getting the stereographic projections. So, this is our longitude line and this is our latitude lines in the wolf net itself. So, same thing we are making the replica and from that we are going to trace the uh, exact place of a particular point. So, generally wolf net is used for measurement of angle between points on stereogram construction of, of stereograms for different crystal systems. How we are going to do? So, steps 1. Tracing sheet is superimposed on the wolf net and pinned together at the center itself. So, first we are putting our tracing sheet on the wolf net itself. Uh, 
draw the primitive circle draw north and south pole axis and east and west axis which is the reference axis over there. Wolf net is kept constant and by rotating the tracing sheet above operations can be performed. How we are going to do I will tell you. So, now rotate the tracing sheet to put poles on same grid circle of the wolf net itself. The poles must be on same longitudinal line. So, how we are going to do? Suppose we are going to measure the point 2 irrespective of point 1. So, simple point 1 and then just we are putting the tracing sheet and then we are trying to rotate and simple by rotations because here you can see that each one gap or maybe the deviations is 1 degree. So, automatically here we are having 9 deviations over there. So, 9 into 10 that means 90 and then 1 unit. So, 91 degree just we are going to do the rotations. So, relation between pole and trace of a plane. Trace becomes a great circle in the stereographic projections. Every point on this great circle is 90 degree from the pole of the plane itself. So, already we have gone through. So, this is the trace from pole it is absolutely 90 degree. Now, method of finding the trace of a pole trace becomes a great circle in the stereographic projections which we have already gone through. Every point on this great circle is 90 degree from the pole of the plane. So, now the steps rotate the projection until the pole falls on the equator of the underlying wolf net. So, you are having any point over there. So, just first you have to rotate your tracing paper so that this p point or maybe p 2 prime will fall on to a some particular projection lines. Then trace the meridian which cuts the equator 90 degree from the pole. So, now you have to find these lines. So, automatically this will be became your trace over there. So, by this way you can calculate the pole and trace of a particular plane. Now, next one is that rotation of pole about an axis. So, first rotation of pole about north to south or maybe north south axis problems. Rotate the poles A1 and B1 by 60 degree about the north south axis direction of motion being from west to east. So, that means from west to east you have to rotate it and this A1 point and B1 point you have to rotate A by 60 degree. So, rotate the point on the same latitude by 60 degree from west to east pole A1 after rotation by 60 degree a 1 moves to a 2 it is very straightforward. So, 60 degree rotations it is coming to a 2 point. For b 1, b 1 is rotated only 40 degree to reach the edge of the projection then it moves 20 degree in form the diametrically opposite end staying on the same latitude to reach b 2. Yes, of course, because it is already there 20 degree. So, I have to move 40 degree over here then again from back side it will come another 20 degree. So, B 2 formation will be taking place here. So, that is the point. Now, second one rotation of pole about an inclined axis. So, what is the problem? Rotate A 1 about B 1 by 40 degree in a clockwise directions. So, our A 1 point is over here, our B 1 point is over here. So, now we have to rotate A 1 reference is B 1 with or maybe the by 40 degree angle. So, what we have to go do because B 1 first we have to put into the center so that no projections is going to be changed. So, for making this B 1 up for up to B 2. So, we have to rotate 48 degree first. So, we are rotating 48 degree. So, B 1 is becoming B 2 in this case A 1 becoming A 2. So, now our problem is that we have to rotate it by 40 degree. So, again we are doing the rotations of 40 degree in this particular case because it is into the center. If I change the positions of the A 1 or A 2 or maybe A 2 to A 3. So, here nothing is going to be changed. So, that is why you are keeping it into the center. So, now we are rotating it 40 degree. But initially we have given the rotations of 48 degree. So, again we have to back 48 degree once again. So, that again it will become over here and we will get the point A 4 which is the final point. So, irrespective of B 1 new point formation will be A 4 which is the rotations by 40 degree. 
So, same thing has been written over here. Now, what are the methods for determining the crystal orientations? So, there are mainly three basic or maybe the main methods. First one is called the back reflection low method, second is called the transmission low method and the third one is called the diffractometer method. So, back reflection low method, the low pattern of a single crystal consists of a set of diffraction spots on the flame and the positions of these spots depend on the orientations of the crystal. The back reflection method is the more widely used because back reflection no special preparations of the specimens is required. So, any thickness can be done. Transmission method relatively thin specimens of low absorption. So, that is why it is widely used. Since the orientation of the specimen is to be determined from the location of the low spot on the flame, it is necessary to orient the specimen relative to the flame in some known manner. So, what are the types of specimens? If it is wire or rod, so orientation of specimen relative to the flame will be mounted with their axis parallel to one edge of the rectangular flame and a fiducial mark on the side nearest the flame. I will show you in the next slide. Sheet or plate mounted with their plane parallel to the plane of the flame and one edge of the sheet or plate parallel to an edge of the flame. And the third one is called the irregularly shaped fiducial marks on their surface to fix their orientations relative to that of the film. So, now first is that determination of orientations of the crystals from the positions of back reflection low spots. So, first measurement of the x y coordinates of the diffraction spots on the flame, determination of the orientation of the plane normal in terms of its regu angular coordinates causing each spot by using Greninger chart. Plotting of the stereographic projections of these poles of the plane and measuring the angles between them, identification and indexing of planes by comparing their measured angles with a list of known interplanar angles for the crystal involved. So, first position of diffraction spots on the flame. All planes of one zone diffract beam which lie on the surface of a cone whose axis is the zone axis and whose semi apex angle is equal to the angle phi at which the zone axis is inclined to the transmitted beam. So, this is the phi and this is the zone axis and this is the diffraction beam. So, diffraction plane is rotated about the zone axis A B and H K. So, one suppose plane is over here. So, the diffraction point is going over here, then the plane is rotating like this way. So, automatically there will be a line or maybe the ellipse will be formed in this particular zone on the flame itself. So, in back reflection loo method, diffraction spots on the flame due to the planes of a single zone in the crystal lie on hyperbola when phi is more than 45 degree and less than 90 degree and straight line when the phi is, is equal to 90 degree. So, in this particular case, the A B is the locus of plane normal intersections with the flame. So, this is the A B. H k is the locus of diffracted beam intersections. So, this is the H k. C n is the plane normal. So, in this case C and your n will be the normal. So, this one and S is the positions of a diffraction spot. So, this is the S. So, same thing it has been elaborated over here. So, intersections of a conical array of diffracted beam with flame. So, simple as I told that how it is forming an ellipse over there. So, the orientation of the plane normal in space can be described by its angular coordinates that is gamma and delta. So, gamma is over here, this is the gamma and delta is over here. So, delta. Now, second one determination of gamma and delta from the measured coordinates x y of the diffraction spot s on the flame. So, how we are going to calculate these all these points? So, by Greninger chart method. So, generally the graphical method of finding gamma and delta, here it is the gamma and here it is the delta. So, from the measured coordinates x and y of the diffraction spot s on the flame, Greninger developed a chart which 
when placed on the film gives directly the gamma and delta coordinates corresponding to any diffraction spot. So, simple we have to fit it into the Greninja chart itself. So, from figure how he has calculated? So, from figure x is equal to O s sin mu of this point, y is equal to O s cos mu and what is O s? So, that is O c tan 2 sigma. So, tan 2 mu is equal to f n by f o is equal to c f tan delta by c f sin delta. So, c f c f will be cancelled which is nothing but the tan delta by sin gamma. So, in this case tan 2 mu is equal to f n by f o is equal to c f tan delta by c f sin gamma. So, c f c f will be cancelled. So, tan delta by sin gamma. So, tan sigma is equal to O n by O c is equal to f n by sin mu into 1 by c f cos gamma is equal to c f tan delta by sin mu into 1 by c f cos gamma. So, c f c f will be cancelled. So, tan delta by sin mu into cos gamma. So, in this case O s is equal to O c tan 2 sigma tan sigma is equal to tan delta by sin mu cos gamma. With these equations the positions in terms of x and y this x and y of any diffraction pot can be plotted for given value of gamma and delta and any desired specimen film distance d. So, in this case this O c is the is equal to the d which is nothing but the specimen film distance over there. So, the hyperbolas running from left to right are curves to of constant gamma and any one of these curves in the locus of diffraction spots from plane of a zone whose axis is tilted away from the plane of the film by indicating indicated angle gamma. So, like this oh, we can get gamma is equal to 0 degree, 10 degree, 20 degree then in this case we are getting the value of delta 20 then delta 10 and the delta 0 and this is the 2 D. So, in order to know after processing the orientations the film had during the x-ray exposure the upper right hand corner of the film viewed from the crystal is cut away. When the film is read this cut corner must therefore, be at the upper left. So, this is the cut corner just to make the mark that which side I am getting the point and how I am going to and what is the crystal positions or maybe which side I am keeping the crystals. Now, steps the Greninja chart is placed over the film with its center coinciding with the film center. So, this is the case and with the edges of chart and film parallel. So, in this case film and your Greninja chart is parallel. The gamma and delta coordinates corresponding to any diffraction spots are then read directly. So, we can easily get the positions of the diffraction spot. So, the gamma and delta coordinates corresponding to diffraction spots on the lower half of the film are obtained simply by reversing the Greninja chart end for end. Next one is called the plotting of the stereographic projections of the poles of the plane. So, knowing the gamma and delta coordinates of any plane normal the pole of the plane can be plotted on a stereographic projections. So, this we have got from the our last slides. So, note underlying wolf net must be oriented so that its meridians run from side to side. The reasons for this is the fact that diffraction spots which lie on the curves of constant gamma come from planes of a zone and the poles of these planes must therefore, lie on a great circle of the projections. So, this is the vital point over there. So, now we are going how we are going to plotting. So, plotting the axis of a zone of planes on the projections first rotate the film such that the hyperbola of spots is lined up with the horizontal hyperbola of the chart itself. So, it will match over there. So, this is the row spots generally what we are getting. So, simple we are rotating it so that it will match on that perfectly on line. Now, measure gamma and epsilon, epsilon is at what degree just I am rotating that film. So, them on the tracing sheet using wolf net to get the projections over there. So, simple we will get 
that on the grid circles all the points are lying. So, this is the axis of zone A which is nothing but known as the P A and this is the angle of rotations. Next is that identifications and indexing of planes. So, this procedure can be illustrated by taking the example of aluminum crystal. So, first selected diffraction spots or back reflection loom pattern of an aluminum crystals are traced and numbered for references. So, we have numbered all the spots over there. The poles of the planes causing these numbered spots are plotted stereographically. So, all the poles has been plotted over there. With the aid of a wolf net, great circles are drawn through the various sets of poles corresponding to the various hyperbola of spots on the film. So, we have drawn all the hyperbola over there. The angles between important poles, here important poles is 5, because you can see that maximum poles has coincided in this particular point 5 prime. So, the angles between the important poles zone intersections and zone axis are measured and the poles are identified by comparing of these measured angles with those calculated for cubic crystals. The method is essentially one of trial and error method. Next second that is transmission Liu method. So, for a specimen of sufficiently low absorptions, a transmission Liu pattern can be obtained and used in much the same way as back reflection Liu pattern to reveal the orientations of the crystals. In transmission Liu method, the diffraction spots on the film due to the planes of a single zone in the crystal lie on if it is ellipse. So, for small values of phi parabola when phi is equal to 45 degree, hyperbola when phi is more than 45 degree, straight line when phi is equal to 90 degree. So, in this case particular case you can see that C is the crystals over there. So, crystal planes Z A. So, this line is the your zone axis, F is the flame over there and phi is the semi apex angle of cone. So, this is the phi over there. So, now consider the diffraction from a plane of zone whose axis lies on the Y Z plane at an angle phi to the incident beam. So, in this particular case we have already gone through. So, this is the zone axis over there. So, this is the incident beam is going over there and then A P where A then your P then your E then B and W A is the locus of the pole of diffraction plane which is known as the great circle. And in this particular case D R O and D these circles which is blue in color dotted is the locus of the diffraction spots on the film which is elliptical in nature. So, any particular orientation of the plane is characterized by particular values of phi and delta the angular coordinates of its pole. So, anyhow we are going to measure the angular coordinates of any points or maybe the pole. Next is called the Leonhard chart. So, Leonard chart is used to determine the angular coordinates of the diffraction spots. This chart is exactly analogous to the Greninger chart for solving the back reflection patterns and is used in precisely the same way. Actually, there are so many methods by which we can easily measure the crystal structure or maybe the crystal orientations of any particular materials. So, it consists of a grid composed of two sets of line. Lines of constant phi corresponding to the meridians on a wolf net, lines of constant delta corresponding to latitude lines. In this case, you can see that one is constant phi lines which is in dotted in nature and another one is the constant delta lines which is in dark line over there. So, this is 10, 20, 30 like that and this is 10, 20, 30 like that. So, this is the constant phi lines over there and this dark is the constant delta lines. So, the dashed lines are lines of constant phi and the solid lines are lines of constant delta. 
So, plotting of the stereographic projections. So, suppose I am going to get one point over there. So, determination of angular coordinates phi and delta of diffraction spots 1. So, I am going to calculate of this one. So, simple I am putting into the wolf net and simple I am getting the longitude and latitude of that particular point. So, plotting of stereographic projection of diffraction font O prime in this particular zone if I know the phi and delta value. Plotting the axis of a zone of planes on the projections. So, rotate the film such that the hyperbola of spot is lined up with the horizontal hyperbola on the chart itself. So, just I have to rotate the film. Measure phi and epsilon and because epsilon we know that how much degree of rotations I am doing over there to match the horizontal hyperbola. So, we can get the epsilon value over there, we can get the phi value in this particular point. So, phi and epsilon and map them on the tracing sheet using the old net to get the projection over there. So, simple the poles of diffraction planes are indexed in the same way as back reflection pattern. Now is the last one which is called the diffractometer method. So, in the diffractometer method monochromatic radiations is used a single crystal will diffract only when its orientation is such that a certain set of diffraction planes is inclined to the incident beam at an angle theta which satisfies the Bragg's law for the set of planes and the characteristic radiations employed. So, simple our machine XRD equipment is following these methods or maybe we are getting the results by this method itself. But actually in the back end that whatever the formula or maybe that whatever the projection is going on that is followed by the all uh, those methods which I have discussed earlier. Three possible rotations axis in a diffractometer are diffractometer axis tangent to the specimens that is a a prime. So, a a prime normal to the specimen surface that is b b prime over there. So, suppose the orientation of a cubic crystal is to be determined for such crystal it is convenient to use form 1 1 1. There are 4 sets of these and their diffracting power is usually high. How to do? First calculate the 2 theta value for 1 1 1 reflection or if desired the 2 2 2 reflection from the known spacing of form 1 1 1 planes and the known wavelength of the radiations used. Fix the detector in these 2 theta positions. Then rotate the specimen holder about the diffractometer axis until its surface and the rotation axis A A prime is equally inclined to the incident beam and the diffracted beam. So, you have to rotate. The specimen holder is then fixed in these positions, no further rotations about the diffractometer axis being required. Then by rotations about the axis B B prime, so just you have to rotate this one, one edge of the specimen or a line drawn on its it is made parallel to the diffractometer axis. So, one is the rotation of this one, another one is the rotation of this one. So, like this way we the diffractometer is working. Now, the crystal is slowly rotated about the axis A A prime and B B prime until an indication of a reflection is observed on the rate meter. Computerized diffractometers allow this search to be automated. The computer systematically checks different combinations of rotations about the axis A A prime and B B prime until a peak is found. Once the positions of the crystal for diffraction has been found, the normal to one set of form 1 1 1 planes coincide with the line C n over there. So, like this way we can plot all the points over there. The pole of these diffracting planes may now be plotted stereographically. So, we are plotting all the elliptical lines over there. So, the projection is made on a plane parallel to the specimen surface with the ns axis of the projection parallel to the reference edge. Two form 1 1 1 poles are enough to fix the orientations of the crystal, a third should be located as a check. Now, we are already discussed about the XRD and the stereographic projections. Now, what is the advantage for this diffractometer method? In the hands of an experienced operator, the diffractometer method is faster than either Liu method. 
it can yield results of greater accuracy if narrow slits are used to reduce the divergence of the incident beam. But of course, there are certain limitations. What are those? The diffractometer method furnishes no permanent record of the orientation determinations, whereas loop patterns may be filled away for future reference. The diffractometer method does not readily disclose the state of perfections of the crystal. Whereas, a Liu pattern yields this kind of information at a glance and in many investigations, the relative perfections of a single crystal is of as much interest of its orientations. Now, we have reached to the last slide of this particular lecture. So, now we are going to summarize the whole lecture. So, in this particular lecture, we have studied about the isolated single crystal requires the accurate knowledge of the orientations of the single crystal stays test specimen as they are anisotropic in nature. Three main methods of determining the orientation of single crystals we have, which we have discussed in this particular lecture. First one is called the back reflection Liu method, second one is called the transmission Liu method and third one is called the diffractometer method. Transmission method is used for relatively thin specimens of low absorptions, whereas no spatial sample preparations is required for the back reflection method. The diffractometer method is faster than either Liu method, but it does not furnish a permanent record for future reference. Thank you.